there in the mid 1980s, you were plugging along in Cup, and mm. you were doing okay. Uh, but then in 1988, it seemed like somebody turned on a light switch, and you're running pretty doggone good all of a sudden. Uh, what was the difference that year in particular? I think I just I didn't have a lot of experience probably when I when I went to the Cup Series. I, you know, I was I was very competitive in the Bush Series, and I was. Uh, and it seemed like that for the most part, I was I was the only young guy that really could run with the Cup guys when they came to run the, the on the speedways. You know, even even though I was pretty new at it, and uh, you know, I I was probably the the best of the regulars on those type of racetracks, the Charlottes and the Rockinghams and the Darlingtons. But I don't I don't know that that means I was ready for the Cup Series necessarily. And I ran five races. In '83, and then then we ran a limited schedule from that point on. I just I think a lot of things combined. The fact that you know, or I was learning more. I think probably around you know '85. I, I think I started kind of figuring it out. Even though '84 was my rookie year and had some good finishes, had some good top tens and stuff in '84. But I think '85 is when I kind of started figuring it out and our stuff. Uh, you know, the, the equipment we got better. And 87, I was able to run the full season. 87, we were actually going to share one car. Instead of both Benny and I running 16 races or whatever the case may be, we were going to share one car. And then in some of the races, we would run two cars, like the Daytona 500. Some of the bigger races, we would run two. Well, then Tim Richmond got sick, and Rick Hendrick called Benny to, to drive for Hendrick. Okay. So, so yeah. Benny went to do yeah. that. So that opened up the 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 car full time for me in 1987. So I was able to run all the racetracks in 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 our good good equipment. So again, every year we got better. You know, 80, 84 we were better than 83, 85 we were better than 84, 86 we were better than 87. You know, we got you know, we had some pretty good races, some pretty competitive races. And then we you know, they came Oldsmobile came out with a new car in 1988, the Cutlass Supreme, uh new body style, and I think it was it was better. And for whatever reason, I think you know that body style was better, and and I was getting, I was gaining on it, and and, and we just started running well. 1988, you go into the Daytona 500, and you finished third. Mm -hmm. And if it hadn't been for those pesky Allisons <laughs> up front, <laughs> yeah. What were your expectations going into Talladega? Because of how well you had run at Daytona, in particular. What were your expectations going into Talladega that spring? Well, they were really high, but we even even before I we always were competitive at Daytona Talladega. I mean, those were the races that I would circle at the beginning of the year because I knew I knew we could be competitive there. I was I was a pretty good drafter. I was you know I was able to do a a pretty competent job there. So I knew that our stuff was fast, and I knew we would have a great a great chance. And in the practice leading up to the race at Talladega, I mean. Everybody in the garage knew that our car was really good. We ended up qualifying third, but I remember one of our guys, I don't remember who it was, he drove, drove at that time you would drive the car to the gas pumps from the garage area, drive it back if you, know, if you weren't going to go out to practice. Somebody, one of our guys drove the car to the gas pumps and two or three people lined up behind him because they wanted a draft with us in practice. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just going to the gas pumps. <laughs> but we knew it was yeah. it was really good. I remember Kyle Petty and I in practice on Saturday got together and 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 were really really good. You know, passed some really good cars and, and were able to drive away from some cars. So uh, we knew I, I knew that we would have a great a great chance. But who who knows how things will play out? You know, race day. What do you remember about the race? Well, we uh, obviously the car was really fast. We got the lead. Caution came out. We'd probably run about, I don't know, 15 or 20 laps. I'm guessing, maybe half, maybe not halfway to a fuel stop. We we're leading. We end up staying out and 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 to retain the lead. And the thing goes green, and I'm gonna have to make a green flag pit stop. So I make a green flag pit stop. And what I and I didn't know this at the time, and I think it was a long time before I realized this as well, is Leo gambled. Leo was a crew chief. Leo gambled and said, let's just put one can of gas in so we'd minimize the time on pit road. Because, you know, we weren't we, – that was the first year of restrictor plates in 88, but we're still probably r racing at 200 miles an hour or thereabouts. 
uh, let's just put one can of gas in so we don't spend as much time on pit road and see if we can get back out in front of the leader to try to, you know, at least stay there again. Then we can run 20 more laps and they're going to have to pit in 20, lap, you know, 20 laps anyway. So, so we did that and we're out and we came out in front of the leaders, but the draft caught me and I'm, I'm racing. Kenny Schrader was leading the race at the time and Kenny was trying to, trying to basically trying to lap me. Well, he got loose and spun out trying to lap me and that, that number one, that got me my lap back because I was able to, you know, you didn't have any free pass back then. You had to be in front of the leader when the caution came out and beat him back to the line uh, in order to get, to, you know, to get your lap back. So I was able to do that. Kenny spun out, and I was able to get back to the start-finish line to get back on the lead lap. So. All right. Um, we talked to Andy Petrie for the show mm -hmm. um, a year or so ago, and let's just say that he said that that car was very, very special. Mm-hmm. He, he wouldn't confirm anything in particular that was special. He just kind of basically grinned and winked about it. Mm -hmm. Once and for all, what was going on with the car that day? Just fast. Ah. It was just fast. <laughs> it was worth a shot. You'll have to go back. You'll have to go back and talk to Andy then, I guess. <laughs> all right. Um, when you won at Bristol in what's now the Xfinity Series, uh, you said it was the biggest win of your career. Then you go to Talladega, and you're standing in Victory Lane, and that's a place where your brother had stood, where Richard Petty had stood. Well, Benny actually never won Talladega. Did he not? Mm -hmm. That was one of the few race tracks okay. that right. he that he wasn't able to win at. Okay. I mean, there wasn't. I mean, Rockingham, which was his home track because he lived in Ellerby, ten yeah. miles yeah. away. He never won at Rockingham. He never won at Martinsville. And he never won at Talladega. About most of the rest of the places he did. With that being said, what did it mean to you to be on the mountaintop? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I can't. It, it's, I can't even describe it today. Over thirty years later, I mean, just just the the uh, you, you know euphoric. I mean, it was it was. Uh, something I'd work. I mean, at, I'm 30 years old at, at that time, and it's something I'd w literally worked my entire life for. Literally worked my entire life for. And I and I was at the time. I said, "Well, this just is just the start. You know, this is just the start, and, and there's going to be so many more of these. And but this this one feels so good. It's the first one." 1989. Was Harry Gant considered an actual teammate of yours, or had Richard and Leo? split up into two separate teams at that point. What was that dynamic? Hal Needham, who had owned the Skull team right. that entire time, had uh, decided to get out at the end of the 88 season. So um, U.S. Tobacco decided they wanted to keep going with Harry Gant. So the, the logical thing to do was to come over and, and join up with Richard and Leo who would, who would essentially who would own the team by this at this point, and we again in, in '88 uh, we we we, ba we basically ran I either ran for Richard or for Leo in 1988. We sp kind of split it up that way. Leo had his races and Richard had his races in 19 because uh, we had a shop in Denver, but that that all the cars were prepared in. But but Leo and Richard both lived in Asheville and ran their business up there. Uh, and, and Leo had actually branched off and started another business, Precision Products Performance, to do all the racing stuff. Richard maintained the, uh, the, the other Precision Products business to do mostly industrial kind of work or whatever. So Leo, they decided to uh, start bring a second car into our team. Leo built a shop up there adjacent to his Precision Products Performance building in Asheville, and then and then to run Harry, and then I, Richard, still maintained the shop in Denver that I would race out of. So we were, we were teammates in, in a, in a, of a sort, other than, you know, Leo's and Harry's cars were all in Asheville, and my cars and Richard's cars were all in Denver. Now, Andy, at this time, had become crew chief, and he went to Asheville with Leo. And, uh, and, then, and, and, and then we... We stayed in, in Denver in, in 1989, and Richard was essentially my crew chief, even though he spent most of his time in Asheville, you know, during the week, and then we would meet up and go to the races. 
At what point was the decision made that you would leave the team at the end of 89? We, it was, you know, as, as good as 1988 was. And again, I, we'd, we'd gotten better every year. Yeah. From the time we started in 83, we got better every year, better results, better finishes, top 10 in points in 88, won Talladega, finished third into 500, third into Firecracker 400, second at Wilkesboro. Really, you feel, seem like we're on to something. Well, nothing went right in 1989. Nothing went right. Finished fifth in the Daytona 500. I said, okay, well, you know, it, a great start. And then the rest of the year was just horrible. I wrecked a lot. And we just didn't have the speed. And I was trying to carry it on my shoulders and, 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 and couldn't do it. Wrecked a lot, got involved in a lot of wrecks. And, and, and I, just did, I just felt like it was, it was time to do something different. So uh, I decided towards the end, uh, maybe September or whatever, that, that if there was an opportunity to leave, then, then, then I would leave. Did you have a sense that maybe the two teams were taken away from each other or – well, I, I had a sense that I felt like we, we lost the, the Leo's part of it. Rich and Leo were such a great combination together. And, and we lost Andy as well, and who Andy had, had, had really come, come along and was a terrific crew chief and really knowledgeable. Uh, so I, I felt like that really, I felt like I, you know, I felt like our team really paid the price for that in, in 1989. Phil, this is a tough question to ask, uh, and I, I don't know any other way to put it other than to say, what happened at Morgan McClure? Well, uh, I thought that was a, I thought it was going to be a great opportunity. We went to Daytona and were really, really fast, and got got involved in a wreck. Uh, uh, Rob Moroso ran into me, and and he and I and AJ wrecked or whatever. Then we went to, I think Richmond may, might have been next. And I reckon practice, going out to uh, to try to make a qual mock qualifying run. Reckon practice, and uh, and then we end up running the race, and then go to Rockingham and get involved in a wreck at Rockingham. I mean, just start out as bad as it could start out, and uh, and Larry McClure decided to make a change. Is there any way to put into words what your reaction was? I mean, that was three races. Mm -hmm. That's. That's not a very good test case, in well, my opinion. Well, that, and that's what I thought. And, and, you know, we talked about winning Talladega and how euphoric that was. And that was, you know, the highlight of my life to that point or whatever. And you thought it was just the beginning. Well, this, this was the low point of my life. This was, this was by far, you know, way, uh, way harder than when I ran out of money. And had to go see Humpy to to try to figure out a, a plan with my life and try to try to stay in racing. This was, uh, this was uh, as as indescribably uh, happy I was to win Talladega. This was just the opposite, Indescrib indescribably distraught over that. You and I talked very briefly before we started recording, but uh, I did do a story, uh, talk to you and Marsha uh, for a story and scene. Uh, before I started working there full time, uh, about the rumors that were going on concerning your eyesight, you had had a cataract mm -hmm. surgery on your right, left eye, left left eye, mm -hmm. after the '89 season. Mm -hmm. How did those rumors get started? I don't know, honestly. I, I don't know. Uh, there were there was talk that you there was something going on with your eyesight. Yeah. Well, there was, and I d I mean I had cataract surgery. Yeah. I yeah. Could, without a doubt. Yeah. But it certainly didn't affect me. I still had 2015 vision, yeah. you know, and I didn't lose any peripheral vision or whatever. Uh, but I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know where. I didn't at the time. I wondered if 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 Larry McClure, because uh, he was he was well aware. It. I told him. I don't know if he was. Uh, I, at the time, I said, well, maybe he was trying to use that to justify getting rid of me. And I don't. I don't have confirmation that that ever happened. I don't know that he did. Uh, I always wondered if that was the case. I probably, you know, haven't spoken to him very much since since 1989 uh, or 1990, I should say. But uh, I don't know. Honestly, don't know. And there was no truth to it, other than yeah. it certainly was the fact that I had 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 cataract surgery, which the eye doctor was kind of surprised at, at my age that I had a cataract. But it's typically, obviously, with somebody older. So, 
Well, 30 years later, you're not wearing Coke bottle glasses. I don't, I don't wear contacts. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Did you and Marsha have a sense that maybe that had damaged your career? Oh, there, 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 was no, there was no sense to it. Without a doubt, it did. Did people actually mention it to you when you would go talk to a team? So there was a couple that did. Yeah. Really? Mm-hmm. What would they say? We heard that you had a, some, you have a vision problem. I said, well, I'll take any, any eye test you want to, want to take if that's the case. But, but, the, but the perception was potentially there. Wow. How difficult was it to pick up the pieces after that? What, what kept you going? Well, I, I, I met a fella by the name of Gary Bechtel. Okay. Uh, through Felix. Yeah. And uh, Gary was, was a neighbor of Felix's. And, and I, think, I think maybe Felix made the context that Gary's thinking about running some races. Would you be interested talking to him? I said, absolutely. So I went and met with Gary, and he decided to, uh, to run, um, run a few races toward the end of the year. And so that kind of kept In me. In 90? 1990. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ran a few races. And uh, another situation, just like Lou and Jenny Mantle, became – Tremendous friends. You know, our relation, racing relationship didn't last that long, but uh, but just, just his, him and his family, such quality people, just love them to death. Actually, went to a went to a dinner with with Gary last year at at at, uh, at Richard Childress's Vineyard. So, uh, but that get, that got me going, and uh, and then decided in in '91. You know, Marsh and I did some soul searching. Said, hey, I don't. I don't see it happening in the Cup Series. I mean, I mean, I've talked to people, and I would go to the racetrack and feel like a duck out of water, or try to you know try to talk to people about ride. Why don't? What do you think about you know getting a bush car, you know, going kind of going back to our roots a little bit, and we'll race it when we can afford to race it. And uh, so that's what we decided to do. We bought a car from uh, from Don Beverly, who who had I'd actually. John, Don Beverly and John Dotson started a team in '89, uh, and I and we got sponsorship from Skoll and Crown Petroleum at the time was my sponsor in the Cup Series. They did, we did like ten or eleven races in 1989. I finished second three times out of those ten or eleven races. I bought one of those cars that from them that I had run, and we got uh, we got ready. We got it ready over the winter, but basically by myself, and to, said we'll we'll run whatever races we can run whenever. We can afford to run them if we can find sponsors for whatever the case may be. But at that time, there was very, there was, you know, I had really nothing going in the Cup Series whatsoever. So, May of 1994, you go to Charlotte, and you win. Yeah. And this, and this is that same, this is, this is the, basically that same team that we started for the 91 season. Ran five races that year, seven the next year, and that team built up yeah. to the point where we go to Charlotte in 94. And and this is the absolutely crazy thing about that race weekend. There were 23 cars that failed to qualify. So you're talking, what, 66 cars mm -hmm. there that weekend. <laughs> That's how it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> what do you remember about that weekend? Well, we went to test. We went over the test, and we spent about a half a day, and the, and the car was really, really good. And, and it's kind of a uh, – a bit of a throwback. Remember, way back when I when I was first getting started, I told you about Tex and, and Mike really teaching me how to work on a race car. Well, Mike was part of my crew there in the 1994, and uh, along with just a, just a lot of friends, and uh, uh, we had I had one full time person helping me, Mark Connolly, and but Mike and his guys would come from uh, and pit the car and work actually work, not only pit the car but work with us during the during the race weekend or whatever. So. Uh, Ted Condor, the late Ted Condor's good friend of mine, he was he was a spotter and he helped us and and uh, when we tested, I knew we had a good car, and then we qualified. I don't know somewhere around tenth, twelfth, something like that, and I knew it was fast. And it was from the time they dropped the green flag, the car was fast. But again, there was a lot of competition. I mean, all the because there were sixty some cars. I mean, fifteen, twenty of them had had Cup drivers in them, not necessarily Cup teams running them, but yeah. Cup drivers. I mean, Dale Senior and 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 Michael and Mark Martin and for Roush or whatever. So, but the thing was just fast and finally got the lead uh, in the second half of the race. 
made, made a pit stop. We had a lug nut get jammed in the, in the lug wrench and, and lost the lead. I said, don't worry about it. We'll get it back. The car's good enough. We'll get it back. So we, uh, we finally, finally chased Mark down and caught him and passed him and, and drove away. Drive away from Mark Martin yeah. in the Bush Series, the right? Bush series, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You almost said that with a straight face. Well, yeah. <laughs> I remember when, uh, you know, early on, go going back early on, we uh, I finished like fourth at Darlington, which was really disappointing because Mark finished third. And usually, if you know, I mean, yeah. if 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 you yeah. if you finish behind Mark, you should have been second. But Mark didn't win that day. But anyway, yeah, that was a that was a, that was huge. I mean, that was huge. And 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 we talked about how big it was to win at Bristol and how big it was to win at, at Talladega. But after what I'd been through probably the previous five years, I'm not sure that that, that win at Charlotte wasn't, wasn't the, the most special of my career, honestly. Well, everybody's there. It was Charlotte. Yeah. I don't know that you could have wanted a better track at that time. So, yeah. 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 I mean, and, and, and again, just, I mean, I mean, and then with, and we did it, our, we did it ourselves. I mean, it was our team, Marsha and I's team, and we just just with a bunch of friends again, one full time employee, you know, and and just a bunch of people that that just you know just wanted just wanted to help and wanted to be there and just just friends, you know. From there on out, the Bush Series was your home. Mm -hmm. Was that something that you were satisfied with, or were you looking for an opportunity in Cup? I I, th I think probably at that point I'm still looking for an opportunity, and and um, that that weekend. When we won the Bush Race at Charlotte in '94, that was the weekend that John Andretti did the double, and I actually had practiced John's Cup car. He's driving for Billy Hagen, okay. So yeah. I had practiced yeah. the Cup car, and if John didn't make it back from uh, from Indy, then I would have driven that car in in the race that year. Uh, so I was still looking for, for Cup opportunities, and and I actually got I, I ran a, a few races for for Harry Melling yeah. uh, later that year, uh, and. Uh, so, I mean, at that point, I was still looking for a couple opportunities. The year 2000 was your last in, mm -hmm. in the seat full-time. I mm -hmm. think you did one. The one race in 2001. In, in 2001, yeah. uh, driving for Tad and Jody. Um, did you just simply make the decision to walk away from the sport, or was that maybe something where you just couldn't well, find a ride? Or? Well, no, nah, e e ESPN had been, had been okay. talking to me All about right. doing TV. And we didn't have a very good year in 2000, and I hated that for Tad and Jody. Uh, I didn't, I didn't think our leadership there on, on the car side was was somebody that could could make a difference. And I, I, I didn't, I, I, I made the choice not to go to Tad and say, I think we need to, you know, get rid of some people and get some new people in here. I decided, well, maybe it's time for me to do something different, and I went ahead and started. Talked to ESPN and went ahead and started doing TV the next year. Of course, the year 2000 uh, was very difficult for a lot of reasons. We lost mm -hmm. Adam and we lost Kenny and we lost Tony. And there was such a controversy about safety. Uh, did that play anything at all Not into at your all. decision? Not at all. Okay. All yeah. right. I, and I, I, honestly, I, I never – I never got in a race car. I raced for maybe 22 years. I never got in the race car and worried about my safety, never once. Even, you know, people talk about, we talked earlier about the, the wreck I had at Talladega. I couldn't wait to get back to Talladega the next time I went back there. <laughs> couldn't wait because I knew I would have a yeah. good shot. I mean, it never, yeah. never, never thought about it again. Never, never, never crossed my mind. Never, never thought about safety one time ever getting in a race car. What was your transition to the booth like? Did you have any kind of withdrawal pains from not being in the seat? I I really didn't intend. I, I hadn't intended on retiring. Uh, I I would, you know, was looking for money at the time to try to do do some races. And and Gene Need was over running the operation for Kerbag Ajanian, and the opportunity was there if we could have got found some money to to run a second car for them. They had Jay Sauter was in the primary car. And we never really, I never really could find anything to get it going. They actually found a sponsor, and, and I ran Kentucky, which was my last official race uh, for Gene and, and, and Mike Kerb and, and Kerry Agajanian. And, uh, but we never really found, found any more money. And I, and I probably, even for a couple years after that, I probably I would have got back on the seat. I wasn't going to forsake doing TV, 
but I would have loved to have done some, some, some more racing, but the opportunity just never came about. Did you feel split? I mean, was I, I, talking to race car drivers, it, it's a, it's, it's pretty addictive. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people, it's, it's hard to tear themselves away. Did you felt tor torn away from the car? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I missed it. I, I missed it for, I don't know about torn, but I, but I missed it for a lot of years. Yeah. I mean, I, I missed it bad for a lot, you know, for several years. Now we're 20 years down the road. Now, I, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think about getting back in a car. I mean, I would get back in a car and play. And I ran a couple of those things they had at Bristol, you know, over the years, I, I guess it's probably been 10 years or something since I had the last one. Uh, and that, and that was a lot of fun. And I, and, and it would be something that I would certainly do f for something like that, but I, you know, leave it to the young kids. And I, I, I tell my son Stefan all the time, I, you know, he, cause we've gone testing with his late model back when he had a late model. And so why don't you get in and run the thing? I said, I don't want to make you look bad. I mean, now, you know, you're, you're young, your ego's fragile. I don't want to get in here and run faster than you and make you look bad. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, Oh yeah, right. But anyway, so that's, uh, but, it, but I did miss it for a long time. And miss, miss, cause it's all I ever wanted to do. I didn't, I didn't grow up wanting to do, do TV. I grew up wanting to be a race car driver. And, uh, and I was, you know, pretty fortunate that I got to do it for over 20 years of my life and now I've been pretty fortunate on this side that uh, that I've had a second career this is this this ended my 20th year doing TV full-time wow you've got three kids mm -hmm. uh Kinsley who was with you and Marsha on the cover of the Grand National mm -hmm. scene when you won Talladega mm -hmm. and then you have twins mm -hmm. Stefan and Cammie and so we are kindred spirits there. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Cammy has cheered for the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and Stefan is following in your footsteps as a racer. Trying to, yeah. And I, I, we were kind of talking before we started recording. Did you sit down with Stefan at some point and say, now, you know what, Th this is a really tough gig, and the money's more than likely going to be hard to come by? Are you sure you want to do this? Yeah. Well, I, I, I uh, that probably came along later because uh, Ken Reagan is a good friend of mine. I raced with Ken back in the day, and he was running the uh, Legends and Bandolero operation for for Humpy and Bruton at, at Charlotte Motor Speedway. And, and you know, at eight at eight years old, you can run a Bandolero car. And so for a couple of years, Ken said, "Hey, if you ever want to put Stefan in a Bandolero, you know." Let me know, and I'll set up a, a, a test or whatever. So we kind of put it off, put it off, put it off, and and Stefan was was going to turn uh, was going to turn twelve, and Marcia said, "What do you think about he's he's going to be twelve now? What do you think about calling Ken and see if you can you know, set up a deal for Stefan to run a test a bando car?" So, Done. And it, it wasn't that I, that I was waiting for her to say that. I mean, you know, we we just never really thought about it because you know. We just we just didn't. I did certainly I know how hard the business is, and I didn't want to push, you know. But but it wasn't, you know. He kept asking about it, and I kept asking about it. And so finally, we relented. He was about to turn 12 years old, almost as a birthday present. So I called I called Ken, you know, right away. And shoot, I I think we said that we had that session s scheduled for that day. I mean, it literally took one day for Ken to set something up. And so we went down to Charlotte on the quarter mile, and Stefan went out there and won a won a uh, 600 racing's cars and. Ken said, it looks like he's got the speed. He's not afraid to go fast and whatever. And so uh, there was a guy that had a couple cars, and I ended up borrowing one of them. So so there was a beginner bandit class. So Stefan went out there and was, was pretty competent and ended up rent, winning a race in, in, in his first year during the summer shootout. Uh, we got to win a race or whatever. I, and I think we didn't run all the races in the summer shootout because I don't even think we started till after that it already began. So we ended up winning a race. And... Uh, so then we decided to buy our own car. Uh, we actually, actually, Daryl, we at Michael and Daryl's golf tournament in Nashville that we used to go to every every year. Uh, they had a an auction item was a band a brand new Bandolero that 600 Racing put up and gave to as an auction item. So I bid on that. Well, Daryl outbid me on the thing. I said, Daryl, what are you going to do with that Bandolero? He said. 
well, we'll run it up and down the driveway or whatever. <laughs> I said, well, I want to, I want to bike. My son has started running. I'm going to run. He said, no problem. So, so basically, Daryl let me buy the car, and uh, so I get ready to start that year a little bit more of an ambitious schedule. And I said, I've got two rules, Stefan. I said, rule number one: if we're going to do this, I know how hard it is. I did it my whole life. We're going to have fun. You know, there'll be plenty of time down the road not to have fun, but for right now, if we're going to do this, we're going to have fun, and, and all I ask is you to do your best. So that was, that was our premise, and those were the two only, uh, only rules I had. And so we did that for a couple of years, and then we moved on to Legend Cars and did that for a couple of years, and then on the Late Models and did that for a couple of years, and, and obviously get more serious as time went on, and then he got, he got the opportunity with... Uh, with B.J. McLeod last year to get in some Xfinity races, and we know we know the challenges of, of racing today and how how financially difficult it is, and but we were able to put together enough stuff. And B.J. was really good to Stefan. And at the end of last year, I said, Stefan, I said you may never get to run anymore because we may not have an opportunity to raise any money, but you were able to race at some pretty cool places. He raced at Daytona. He raced at Darlington. He raced at uh, Las Vegas. He, you know, he raced. Uh, I said you raced at some pretty cool places. So, uh, but he, you know, he didn't want to quit there. And and fortunately, with again with BJ this year, he got to run. You know, got to run eight or ten more Xfinity races. And we're looking, you know, looking to do some more next year. And we've got got a little bit of support from some people. Mark SoCal has been so for, you know so giving and helpful. And and. Uh, James Finch has, has helped Stefan since he ran Bandoleros because he's known Stefan since he was born. But James has always come through and always helped Stefan to, you know, he said, you need, get that boy some tires. He needs some tires. He's gonna, if he's going to run that race at Darlington, he needs some tires. You know, so, so James has always, always been there. So, uh, and, and BJ just, I think, thanks the world to Stefan. And, and conversely, Stefan thanks the world to BJ, as, as I do, and his wife, Jessica. So it's been a good situation. It's a great opportunity for him to learn, get some laps, and who, who knows where it can go. But the thing I'm most proud about Stefan and Cami is they both did so well in college. Uh, they both graduated with honors. Stefan from UNCC in marketing and Cami with exercise and sports science at Chapel Hill. Uh, I, so I, I'm, I'm really proud of him for doing that. And, and Stefan did this, mind you, while he was trying to race and trying to work on race cars and go help people and as far as work on race cars. Cammy, while she was cheering, which is which was a full time job at Carolina with with practice and training and stuff like that. So they've uh, they've done really well, as well as Kinsley. Now, we talk about the relationships that I've had with with the Bannels and U.S. Tobacco and the relationship with Gary Bechtel and Tad and Jody. Well, Kinsley works for Tad and Jody right now at JTG. So does she really? Yeah, she sure okay. does. Yeah. Right. Cool. So, yeah. So I'm proud of all my kids. Cammie went to Chapel Hill mm -hmm. and Stefan went to UNC Charlotte. As the father of twins who may or may not be about to head to separate schools <laughs> for the first time in their lives, how difficult a transition was that for Cammie and Stefan and maybe Phil and Marsha? It was, it was, <laughs> it was easy for Cammie and Stefan. Okay. Really easy. Okay. Yeah, because they fought most of their lives, honestly. <laughs> it, it just just at the end of high school, yeah. you know, they end up having this, you know, having the same group of friends, and I think they got closer at the end of high school than they had ever been in their lives, and uh, and then, but I, I don't, I don't, it was never an issue. But I think they talked more once they went away to separate schools or whatever than than they had before, and uh, and once they graduated, now right for right now they're both home. And they're actually looking, possibly looking for a place, a condo or a townhome to buy together. So uh, it's amazing the transformation because, I, I mean, they literally fought probably till they were 15 or 16 years old. And most of it instigated by Stefan, I must say. So, yeah. <laughs> so what I hear you saying is, Rick, it's going to be okay. It's going to be fine. You're going to be fine. <laughs> you and your wife will be fine. <laughs> All right, man. Cool.